Good morning or afternoon or wherever time it happens to be where you are and welcome to our sixth lecture here dealing with substance abuse as I continue my grand adventure across the Pacific. Fiji. I was fortunate enough to spend a couple of days in beautiful Oahu in Honolulu on the north also over on the north shore doing some shopping enjoying myself immensely and getting a little bit of work done there in the midst of that. But that was only a short respite before I moved on through Guam, beautiful island of Saipan in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, where we're coming to you from today. Saipan, truly one of my favorite places here in the Pacific, aside, of course, from Fiji. A lot of Japanese influence here, a lot of beautiful waters, uh, diving, crystal clear blue water, snorkeling. And like I said, lots of, uh, lots of Japanese influence. The other thing that we see here is there's a lot of history. This is one of the islands that was heavily contended over uh, between the United States and Japan during the Second World War. So there's a lot of uh, memorials uh, to, the, to the people who lost their lives here as well. But enough of that. I suppose we should just go ahead and jump right into our lecture today. We're going to be talking about substance abuse. So a topic that is uh, somewhat important to you not only as dentists uh, one of the one of the statistics that we know is that dentists have some of the highest rates of substance abuse uh, simply because of your access to the narcotics but also substance abuse is going to be important for you because as we've mentioned before in some of the lectures you may be the only uh, provider that an individual sees across the year. Maybe they actually decide to come to you because they have a, a tooth that has a true problem in it. And so you need to be aware of the characteristics of substance abuse, the epidemiology of substance abuse, also how to screen for substance abuse, and of course some basic principles in how substance abuse is treated. And of course you also need to know this because it's going to be on the final exam. Alright, so let's just jump right in. Okay, so what it what is it that we're going to be covering? What is it that you need to understand? Okay, so we're going to talk about susceptibility to alcohol abuse and alcohol-related problems in the population. So in other words, who is susceptible? Okay, basically anyone is at risk. Okay, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. Well, anyone who uses alcohol. Okay, we'll talk about some of the most common interventions for alcohol currently in use. We'll talk about some psychosocial interventions. Okay. But we'll also talk about some medical-based interventions, in particular some uh, psychopharmacological interventions that are commonly used. We're going to talk about some of the presenting signs and symptoms. How do you recognize someone who's intoxicated with alcohol? Um, you probably think you already know how to recognize somebody who's intoxicated with alcohol, but we'll give you a few more clues as well. Okay. We're going to talk about uh, withdrawal symptoms okay, associated with individuals who are abusing alcohol. We'll talk about some basic statistics that deal with alcohol. Okay, um, I mentioned there the USMLE, and once again that's the United States Medical Licensure Exam, so not necessarily applicable to you, but the, the idea is applicable. We don't expect you to know everything about substance abuse, just some common things that you might see when you're doing your clinical rotations and then when you get out there and practice. Okay. Right. So let's start with some background, some epidemiology, since that's what I am. Okay. It's important to understand that 50% of emergency department visits are related to substance abuse. Just think about that. 50% of the people that are walking through the doors over there at Colonial War Memorial Hospital probably are there because of some issue related to substance abuse. And of course, the most common issue related to substance abuse that we would see is going to be alcohol abuse. Why alcohol abuse as opposed to some other form of drug or substance? It's simple. Think about it. Alcohol is widely available. I walk into um, MHCC, all right, and I can walk to the alcohol section. I can ask the help, where's the alcohol, and they'll show me. I do not, however, walk into MHCC and say to the lady at the counter, can you show me the marijuana section, all right? Marijuana and other substances that are commonly abused simply are underground, all right? You have to go looking for those things. You don't go to a store, okay? The other thing to understand is that we tend to underdiagnose substance abuse. We look at somebody who is in a high bracket of socioeconomic status. Socioeconomic status is simply a combination of your education and employment. All right. It doesn't necessarily include salary, but it tends to be people who uh, have higher salaries. So people with college education 
organization that have good professional jobs, we look at those people and we say, well, you're not a substance abuser. How could you possibly be abusing alcohol? And especially we look at women. Uh, women who are in high socioeconomic brackets, the so women who are dentists, physicians, lawyers, architects, whatever it happens to be, and we look at them and we say, well, you're a professional. You know, you most likely are not abusing alcohol. Well, that tends to be a mistake on our part because we know that alcohol abuse tends to be present in all brackets of socioeconomic status. It isn't just the guy that's unemployed or living on the street corner who might be abusing alcohol. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. Okay, uh, Among physicians, psychiatrists and anesthesiologists tend to have the highest rates of substance abuse. Um, if we were to look at the statistics, we would also lump dentists in there if we were looking specifically at healthcare providers. Like I mentioned already, dentists tend to like anesthesiologists have access to um, certain drugs, certain narcotics. Okay, so it is a problem among professionals, and that's something for you to keep in mind as you progress throughout your college years, um, as you develop healthy drinking habits. For those of you who do consume alcohol, be aware that you're entering a profession that tends to be stressful. Uh, people tend to turn to alcohol as a way of dealing with stress. You're also entering a profession where you have access to anesthetic drugs, other drugs, uh, Novocaine, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, the anesthetics that you can use and tend to abuse. I can think of one case in particular from the town where I grew up where I had a friend at church who was a dentist and one of his partners, they came into the dental office one morning and the partner had overdosed in the dental chair overnight. He thought he could control his recreational use of the drugs, but it got out of hand and it actually killed him in the end. So keep that in mind, okay? Um, if you see an individual, a colleague who's impaired, all right, has a problem with substance abuse, alcohol abuse, you need to make them stop care immediately because they're a potential risk to our patients. Okay, so first thing to do when dealing with a colleague with a substance abuse problem is confront them. Say, you know, I'm here to help you, but that you need to stop caring for patients right now because in an impaired state you might harm a patient. Okay, if they are unwilling to stop caring for patients, and then the second thing you can do is is encourage them to seek care, professional assistance to deal with their substance abuse problem. If they're unwilling to do that, report them. Okay, uh, report them to the hospital, report them to the clinic where they're working, report them to the uh, Ministry of Health, whatever it happens to be. Your, your obligation is to the patient, your obligation is to protecting the name of the profession, not necessarily just to that colleague. So get them to stop care and uh, enter treatment if they're unwilling to do that. Go ahead and report them so that the higher authorities can force them into seeking care. Um, we mentioned earlier this idea that it's hard to identify a profile of drug users, especially alcohol users. And we know that most people that have an issue with substance abuse are employed full time. So that's the first thing. We tend to think of the individual who's abusing alcohol as unemployed living on a street corner. Well, that's not necessarily true. We also know that about 33% of psychiatric disorders are substance abuse disorders, so there is a high comorbid association between the psychiatric disorders and the substance abuse disorders. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into the final lecture this semester, which deals with the uh, psychiatric disorders. Okay. Not surprisingly, uh, men tend to be the most common abuser. They tend to abuse drugs, including alcohol and other illicit substances, about two times, 2.5 times more often than women. But once again, remember that caveat I gave in the beginning. That does not mean that women are not abusing substances. It simply means that men tend to abuse more often than women. Okay. Um, if we look at our newly admitted psychiatric patients, so remember returning to that idea that 50% of the people that walk through the doors of the emergency department are there because of something related to alcohol or substance abuse disorder, okay? If we look at these individuals, okay, that are entering um, psychiatric care, so however they've entered the system, either through their private practitioner or through the psychiatric department, and then they've been referred, uh, excuse me, through the emergency department, and then they've been referred to the psychiatrist, we know that substance abuse is going to be present in, present in about 50% of those individuals, okay? Um, these dual diagnostic, uh, diagnostic patients, these uh, comorbid patients, very difficult to treat. All right, because we have to treat both the psychiatric issue and we have to treat both the, also the substance abuse issue.
And we have to treat them separately, okay? And we have to treat both of them. If we treat the psychiatric disorder this, without the substance abuse disorder, the substance abuse or disorder is going to remain with those individuals. The other issue that is difficult in terms of treating with these people is they tend to continue to abuse the substance even when they're on the inpatient ward. So when we bring them into a psychiatric setting when we're trying to detoxify these individuals, they continue to find a way to get access to the drugs. And it's not surprising that one of the most common ways they get access to it is uh, visiting family and friends, and then the other way they get access to it is they will actually pay staff members to bring it in. Uh, usually these are low-level staff members cleaning uh, individuals, um, certified nurses assistants, things like that. and when you consider how poorly we pay uh, these individuals that are responsible for housekeeping and so forth, it's not surprising that they're willing to bring in illicit drugs, alcohol for a patient in exchange for a little bit of extra money. Okay. The other thing we need to know is that substance abuse adds to the suicide risk. All right. So if you have an individual who already has an existing psychiatric disorder okay, and we're not treating those, then that in and of itself increases the risk of suicide. If we then add to that, all right, the fact that they're abusing a substance which also in and of itself increases the risk of suicide, and we put the two of them together, then what do we get? We get that the risk of suicide is almost doubled in these individuals. Okay. So let's talk briefly about this idea of addiction, what addiction is, how it works, and why it creates a problem in our patients. Okay. So if we look at a strict de uh, definition of addiction, it's defined as the psychological and physical need for chemical substance by the brain in order to ameliorate negative symptomologies. Okay. Somewhat confusing. Let me explain that. Okay. Simply means that when we become addicted to a substance, our body develops new neural pathways. Okay. Literally develops new neural connections within the brain that says, hey, I like this stuff. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel happy. It makes me forget my problems. Therefore, I need it because I enjoy how I feel. Okay. So in other words, it ameliorates. It takes away negative symptomology. So in other words, if you're stressed in school, Okay, if you're worried about exams, if you're worried about relationships, if you're worried about your job, your family, whatever it happens to be, we know that all of those things cause us psychological stress. So what can we do? We can turn to substance abuse to help take away those negative feelings that we have because it temporarily makes us feel good about ourselves. Okay, so it's... Um, the other thing that we get is that these negative symptomologies can be either physical or they can be psychological, all right? Now, in particular, we're talking about the negative symptomologies that come with withdrawal, okay? So when we have an individual who's addicted, the individual needs it, they crave it, they've developed that new neural pathway for the drug to help them feel good. So the problem is we come along and we take away the substance. Let's say we take an individual who's an alcoholic and... Um, they present to the emergency department and we go ahead and we admit them to the psychiatric ward and we decide we're going to detox this individual. We're going to take away the alcohol. Okay. As we take away the alcohol, what does the body do? The body says, uh, 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 I need that. That's what makes me feel good. So the body says, in order for you to continue to give me the alcohol, I'm going to make you feel really, really bad. Because if I make you feel bad enough, you're going to give me the alcohol to take away the bad feelings. Okay. So what does it do? It can cause uh, tremors. Okay. This is what they call the DT shakes. All right. You may have seen uh, that portrayed in the media. All right. Or the delirium tremors. Okay. The individual will literally begin to shake. Shake. Okay. Um, nausea, the feeling like the individual needs to throw up, dry heaving, things like that. Restlessness, the individual pace back and forth nonstop with undirected motion. They won't be able to sit still for long. Okay, Insomnia, difficulty sleeping, sweating, and so forth. Like I say there, it's all a response to the addiction because the body is craving the substance. It wants to reduce these symptomologies, and it says, if I cause you physical pain, you will give me the drug again. Okay. What are some of the psychological symptoms that we see? Depression is really common in an individual who is both abusing the substance, okay, as well as the individual who's going through a withdrawal from the substance, okay. Anxiety, generalized fear, all right, about the world around them. Anxiety might be against their family, it might be against the physicians, the nurses, so on and so forth. Uh, socially withdrawn, these individuals don't want to interact with their families, they don't want to interact with their peers, they certainly don't really want to interact with the people on the 
psychiatric or the detox wards were trying to help them. Fear of persecutions, everyone's out to get me. All right, the fear that, oh my gosh, I, the doctor's giving me diazepam to help me control the tremors. Well, no, he's not. He's giving me diazepam because he's going to kill me. All right, so there's this fear of persecution, delusions. They see things that are not there. Um, they might be sitting there in the hospital bed and off in the corner of the room. They might see dead grandma. All right, they have delusions that grandma has come and she's yelling things at them and telling them what a failure they are in their life and how they've wasted their life and so on and so forth. So you can see that withdrawal is a very serious uh, issue in these patients between both the physical and the psychological symptoms, which is why we have specific wards designed for dealing with these things. This is why we put people who are, being, who are under withdrawal type symptoms, this is why we admit them as inpatients to treat them so that we can manage symptomologies. Okay, like I said, these are all associated with this concept of withdrawal, okay, or the removal of the addictive substance. And like I mentioned before, because the substance is no longer present, the body continues to experience the negative symptomologies, okay, because once again, the body desires them, okay. So the ingestion of the substance does what? Remember our lecture about reinforcement, okay. The ingestion of the substance gives positive reinforcement to the individual. Okay. Uh, you don't necessarily need to know this. Uh, this would be more applicable to the, the medical students, but in case you're interesting, I mentioned earlier that we actually develop new neural pathways through addiction, or right? physical connections in the brain that say, hey, I need this substance. Okay. Well, the process whereby that happens is through the medial forebrain bundle, and then the process moves on to the nucleus acumens, and then the ventral tegmental area. Okay. That's really more applicable uh, to the neuroscience lectures dealing with the medical students, but it's presented there just for okay. All righty, and just a little bit more epidemiology. Like I said, these are stats from the U.S., but um, the overall concept in terms of the picture is very applicable here in Fiji and in the Pacific, where we know that there is a significant substance abuse problem. We also know there's a significant substance abuse problem among the students, particularly the first-year students uh, like yourselves, okay? Um, anecdotal and also some good research evidence suggests to us that there is essentially a culture of alcohol and substance abuse within the College of Medicine, Nursing, and Health Sciences, whereby we are producing excellent doctors and dentists and nurses and nurse practitioners and public health professionals who are really good at their jobs, but they don't necessarily know how to do anything else in terms of relaxation other than to go out with their friends on a Friday, Saturday night uh, and drink. All right, and to essentially, we know that a significant number of our students end up having difficulties with academic progress. A lot of our students end up being dropped from the programs because the alcohol and the substance abuse becomes a problem such that their grades are impacted. Okay, so it's a real, real, it's a real issue. We know that in many ways, uh, it's perpetuated because the older students introduce the first year students into this culture of alcohol abuse. Hey, you know, let me take you out, show you where the best clubs are, show you where the cheapest place is to get beer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, before I was uh, asked to go to Saipan, and from Saipan, as I told you in class, I'll be moving over to Ponape in the Federated States of Micronesia for three and a half years on a project there. I was the chair of the Alcohol and Substance Abuse Advisory Committee. Uh, across the university and so when I tell you that it was a problem in CMNHS and also across the university I, I, I speak with knowledge, I speak with authority so if nothing else take away from this lecture this idea that alcohol uh, can be enjoyed responsibly all right. It doesn't have to be a problem. It can be part of a fulfilling life for those individuals who enjoy uh, using alcohol socially but it can also become a crutch for you in dealing with difficult situations across your life and as you progress throughout the dental program here and into practice, you will increasingly see the stress of life. All right, and so turning to alcohol can be a significant problem if you're turning to alcohol as a way with, of dealing with the stress. So if nothing else, take away from this lesson that it can be problematic. And if you or someone you know is already experiencing alcohol or substance abuse disorders, there is help available for you within the system. There is confidential help available for you from counselors and those individuals who understand if this is a problem for you or someone you know, I would encourage you to contact the office of the Associate Dean for Student Life, that's Dr. Bernie, 
uh, and her staff, and they will be able to provide you the assistance that you need. Okay, and they will do it confidentially. In other words, they won't tell anybody. Okay, so just a couple of stats to go with that, along with that. Alcohol, uh, you can see it's a very costly program, or a very costly problem. It's a hundred billion dollar a year problem. Hundred billion U.S. dollars. That's a lot of money. Okay. It is probably the most costly healthcare problem in the United States. I know we hear a lot about MCDs, cancer, and diabetes, and so on and so forth. And they are very, very problematic. They are, most pre they are the most prevalent in terms of uh, morbidity and mortality uh, in the United States and also worldwide. But in terms of direct financial cost, all right, such as lost wages, death of the individual, um, time lost from work, unemployment, uh, social problems in terms of uh, divorce, uh, in terms of domestic violence, all things that are associated with alcohol abuse. It is the most costly. Okay, so it costs more money, it costs more social disruption than in any other disease worldwide. Okay. So then, of course, the problem, the question becomes one of prevention. All right? If it is so costly, if it is so damaging to individuals and families and careers and so on and so forth, what does this say about prevention? Okay? Um, it is important that we focus on prevention in terms of preventing. That's what I was mentioning before to you, that if this is a problem for you or someone you know, then you need to seek assistance all right? because it is a problem that can be dealt with. Let me, let me say that again. You can deal with substance abuse. It can be effectively treated if you get the appropriate care that you need. Okay, and careers can be saved. All right, alcohol can destroy careers easily, but careers can be saved if you're willing to seek assistance as well. Okay, one quick point there. I say it's important to remember we're talking about total cost here. Conversely, tobacco costs more lives each year, but it's less financially damaging. Okay. Um, other factors in terms of social and medical costs associated with alcohol include crime. All right, not surprising. How is crime associated with alcohol? Um, the biggest thing I want you to remember is that when we consume alcohol, our inhibitions are lowered. We will do things that otherwise we wouldn't do. You'll notice at the end of this lecture, there's the standard PBL, the problem-based learning thing for you to go through. Okay, one of them deals with a uh, college student who is generally very shy, reserved individual, but when he's consuming alcohol, he picks fights with football players, uh, rugby players, guys that are much bigger than him, which he would never have done if he was sober. Okay, the other thing in in terms of alcohol, if we lower inhibitions, we're more likely to commit crimes. All right, we're more likely to engage in activities. We're more likely to uh, rob a convenience store, uh, beat up our girlfriend, um, engage in risky sexual behavior, so on and so forth, if we're consuming alcohol to a great extent. And if it's a problematic thing and we're doing it every weekend, then it's more like the, the, the likelihood of, the, of engaging in some type of criminal activity is also increased. All right. Um, I mentioned this at the beginning of the lecture, but it's something important to remember. I might want to know this if I were going to take the final exam. In other words, alcohol is one of the mo is the most abused of all substances, whether illegal or legal. Remember what I said. You know, it's simply the availability. You know, you go into a grocery store. There's alcohol available. You can go up and you can steal it if you're underage, all right? Or if you're uh, of adult legal age, you can buy as much alcohol as you want and go home and abuse it. It's a little bit more difficult for you to go out and find marijuana and PCP and so on and so forth, okay? I'm not saying you can't find those things. I'm just saying they're not readily available in a commercial setting, okay? And this is one of the reasons it's also most, the most commonly abused substance among teenagers and early adults simply because it's available, all right? It's not hard for teens to find alcohol. And it's not hard for you once you're of legal drinking age to find alcohol. Look at this, approximately 10% of all adults in the United States, that would be 12 million individuals, are problem drinkers. You can transfer that here to Fiji. Uh, there's 800,000 individuals in Fiji, so that would mean 80,000 of those individuals are problem drinkers. Okay, Causes difficulty in the community. Um, uh, l lower rates of employment where alcohol abuse is present. Higher rates of uh, physical, sexual, emotional abuse in families and communities and so on and so forth. So it is a problem here as well. Okay. Um, the sex ratio for those who abuse alcohol is four males for every three females. We already talked about that briefly. Okay. 
Uh, we mentioned this also as well, the number one illicitly abused drugs among teenagers. This is the important thing to keep in mind here. The age at which teens begin drinking is getting lower and lower. So it used to be, and I'm not saying my generation is perfect because we had problems as well, um, but it used to be that we would see substance or alcohol abuse beginning among teenagers sometime in the 17 to 18 year range, all right, so towards the end of high school. Now we're seeing it in kids as young as uh, 14 and 15, all right, so that age is going down. As the age goes down, so does the likelihood of there being complications associated with the alcohol. Uh, binge drinking, I believe we mentioned it here, and we'll mention it here in a bit in the lecture. Binge drinking is simply drinking massive amounts of alcohol as rapidly as possible with the goal of becoming drunk. Stone cold drunk. Okay, um, That is also becoming a problem among teenagers and as it decreases in age, we're talking about 14 and 15 year olds binge drinking here. Binge drinking uh, is associated with uh, a sudden cardiac arrest, uh, sudden death from cardiac arrest. So a lot of people every year will die from binge drinking and if teenagers are doing this early and earlier, uh, also we have to worry about that it becoming an addiction that they carry on into their college years and throughout their professional lives. Once an individual becomes addicted, especially if they become addicted at an early age to a substance like alcohol, cigarettes, drugs, whatever it happens to be, it is significantly more difficult for them to overcome that addiction later in life, even with appropriate treatment. Okay? And I do want to stress something here. Um, even in a developed, highly, highly developed countries, say like Canada or Australia, there is a paucity, there is a shortage of trained alcohol and substance abuse counselors. There is a shortage of psychiatrists and psychologists who are trained to deal with substance abuse. And most of the general practitioners, family doctors, internists, pediatricians, whoever it happens to, happens to be, are not well trained in treating alcohol abuse, okay, either psychosocially or pharmacologically. So my point is that even in a highly developed medical setting like that, it's difficult to get people the treatment that they need once they are highly addicted, okay? In the early stages before addiction occurs, when it's still basically just in the early stages there, uh, it, it's easier to treat, okay? But once an individual becomes addicted, truly, truly addicted, where we've got those new neural pathways, it becomes a lifelong problem. And you might remember in one of the lectures I talked about the rule of no thumb. So hold, hold your fingers up, all five fingers, put your thumb down and you've got four fingers left. Remember, that's that idea that when we take an individual through the cycle of breaking a habit, they have to go through it four different times before we arrive at true abstinence. And this is true as a general rule of no thumb for alcohol and other substance abuses. So across the lifespan, an individual who maybe started drinking at an early age, say 14, 15, is going to have to go through withdrawal and going to have to go through drug and alcohol counseling four different times before they actually maintain sobriety or abstinence from the substance. Okay, So uh, going through that process is costly both in terms of the impact on family because usually nobody is willing to go through uh, counseling for their alcohol and their substance abuse until they hit a very, very low point where they've lost their job, their wife has divorced them, taken the kids away from them, and they're truly, truly at rock bottom. And so if they have to progress through that four times, think about the cost, all right, both personally as well as socially to that individual. So that's, once again, one of these reasons why we're so worried about young people like yourselves, okay, uh, beginning alcohol and substance abuse early in your lives because it's a problem that tends to carry over long term, okay. So once again, prevention, it says prevention is critical. And that's actually, if you remember, that's what you uh, wrote your uh, your reflective writing assignment on. You know, what are the rules that we should put in place? But rules are only one part of that. Well, so what should communities do, such as our community here at CMNHS, to provide students opportunities to engage in recreational activities and to engage in stress-reducing activities so that they don't turn to alcohol and substance abuse. And that's actually more of an effective means than simply saying, here are the rules, here is how you will be punished if you are using substances. All right, so that's why I was curious about you and your thoughts on that because um, I, was, I, I will go ahead and, and, and turn those generalized ideas, not with your names or anything like that, because it is to be kept confidential, over to the Alcohol and Substance Abuse Committee, which I used to share, and hopefully they can take some of your suggestions in terms of what activities would be good and incorporate those into next year's first year experience. Okay.
All right, moving on with a little bit more epidemiology here. Since 1980, what have we seen? Uh, the rate of alcohol consumption in the general population has actually been decreasing, but despite that, it is still a problem. Why? We already mentioned the age at which people begin drinking is getting lower, hence the problem with earlier addiction. Binge drinking, or like I mentioned earlier, drinking to excess with the sole purpose of becoming drunk has also increased, and is also increasing among high school students and particularly among early college students. Um, many years ago, Tammy and I attended University of Idaho, which is uh, one of the three state universities in the state of Idaho where I'm from, and it is known as a party, party, party school. Okay, it has a lot of sororities, a lot of um, a lot of organizations that encourage that encourage fraternities, sor uh, fraternities and sororities. Uh, you've seen movies about those. These are the uh, the ha the nice houses with the ivy growing on the outside and the major source of entertainment for these fraternities and sororities on a Friday night is is alcohol consumption. And so we were married at the time, so we weren't doing things like that. But we used to walk down fraternity and sorority row on a Friday night and a Saturday night and just marvel at the amount of alcohol that was being consumed. And one evening we saw a gentleman stagger out of the house. He was so drunk and he went face down. Bam! Onto the ground. Uh, missed a stone wall just by a few inches in terms of, of hitting his head slam bang right into the front of that. If he'd gone down on that stone wall, probably would have snapped his neck actually. But the problem was he was only surrounded by other drunk people. So he went down on the ground and he is actually laying, he rolled himself over onto his back. And what's the problem with that? Well, when you've got an alcoholic who's rolled himself over on his back, um, Massive amounts of alcohol consumed rapidly causes nausea, it makes you want to throw up. An individual who's laying on their back and throws up in their mouth, and because they are unconscious because of the alcohol, they're going to aspirate their vomit. Aspirate means to suck in, and they're going to aspirate their vomit down into their windpipe, and they're actually going to suffocate on their own vomit. Okay. Um, some girl that was with him was there, and all she did was laugh, 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 and she continued to consume her Heineken, and she walked away. So here's this individual laying on the sidewalk on a Friday night in Moscow, Idaho, uh, with a potentially bright future ahead of him. He's going to gra possibly graduate from a really good university there, and he, he's going to lay there and possibly suffocate. All right, and nobody is around to do anything about it. So Tammy and I rolled him over. What you can do for these individuals is you can roll them onto their side. That's called the recovery position. So the idea is that as they throw up, it'll get the legs at their mouth and they want to aspirate it. But it just really illustrates this idea that the proportion of heavy drinkers younger than age 20 is rapidly on the rise. So what we're going to eventually see is we're going to see a reverse of that 1980 forward trend because we're going to see that these individuals who are beginning drinking in their teen years and their early 20 years, they're going to become long-term problem drinkers in the population and hence the consumption of alcohol is going to start to grow, go up again. Okay. All right. So what social and medical problems are associated with the above statistics? Okay. Um, I've mentioned those. All right, the, the the number of problem drinkers in the society is going to go up. Uh, with that, we're going to get those social problems I mentioned already. A person who has alcohol abuse problems, eventually he's going to have difficulty maintaining his personal relationship with friends and family and children, and also is going to have trouble maintaining employment status long term. Even though, as I mentioned in the beginning, the majority of alcoholics are employed full time. Okay. Um, I also mentioned at the beginning we talked about how alcohol abuse is spread across all uh, layers of the socioeconomic demographic. Okay, so in other words, you can suspect the well-to-do individual as much as the uh, poor individual of having alcohol abuse problems. Having said as much, there is a pre-dereliction, there is a, a more positive association all right, between individuals of low socioeconomic status and alcohol and substance abuse. Okay, so once again, what does it say about prevention? Okay, um, if you think about prevention uh, in terms of this idea of low socioeconomic status, you would want to ensure that prevention programs look at individuals particular economic and demographic. Okay, um, there's a high correlation between alcohol use and um, automobile accidents, MVAs, motor vehicle accidents. About 15% of all MVAs involve alcohol abuse. Okay. It's also implicated in approximately 50% of um, motor vehicle accidents involving a pedestrian. So in other words, a car hitting a pedestrian. Um, MVA-related fatalities. So about half of all motor vehicle-related deaths 
all right, have involved alcohol, okay? It's involved in 50% of homicides, both the killer and the victim, all right? So in other words, if we see an alcohol-fueled murder, it tends to be both the killer and the victim, all right? The perpetrator and the victim were both consuming alcohol, and things simply got out of hand, and it's also associated with about